to me, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Welcome to uh, Functional Medicine Grand Rounds at the Center for Functional Medicine. I'm so delighted to be here with you today. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and we have a very special guest today, Dr. Patrick Hanaway, who's uh, many of you know very well, who joined me in starting the Center for Functional Medicine over six years ago at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he's a board-certified family doctor trained at Washington University. He served on the executive committee for the American Board of Integrative Medicine and is past president of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. Uh, for the past 20 years, he's worked with his wife in clinical practice and family to family, your home for whole health care in Asheville, North Carolina. He also was chief medical officer at Genova Diagnostics, and he became then the chief medical education officer at the Institute for Functional Medicine, and he oversaw the development of all of our programs worldwide at the Institute for Functional Medicine. He's taught there since 2005. He leads the GI Advanced Practice Module, and he currently supports IFM as co-chair of the Expert Advisory Board. He's also developed the collaboration between the Institute of Functional Medicine and Cleveland Clinic, which I was referring to, and he was the founding medical director and became the research director and now serves as a research collaborator at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, uh, focused on outcomes uh, of functional medicine models of care. Uh, and he's just an extraordinary guy. Uh, he's a good friend, and he uh, had a personal journey uh, with his own health a number of years ago uh, with cancer. And today's conversation and his lecture is going to be about uh, his insights uh, into the biology of cancer, his own cancer, and learnings from that, and what we can do to apply uh, those learnings to to our clinical practice. So thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us uh, at the uh, Grand Rounds for the Center for Functional Medicine. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to see you and many friends are there. Um, I miss being in Cleveland and going to be a part of the team there, but I'm glad that I can continue on in doing some research collaboration with everybody there. It's great work. It's important work. Thank you so much. So what I wanted to talk about, and, and you mentioned it, is about the the awareness of how we work with uh, functional medicine in our own lives and the clinical transformation, the journey that I've had with cancer. So on uh, November 22nd, now November 21st in 2018, I was diagnosed with stage four laryngeal cancer. I'd felt a lump in my neck um, that was firm and hard about five days prior to that. And I went to see a colleague uh, to have him evaluate it. Um, he uh, biopsied it, uh, did a, a needle aspirate of it, and was found to have squamous cells, origin unknown. Uh, PET scan day later uh, demonstrated that there were lymph nodes that were positive on both sides and that there was a, a one by one centimeter mass on the left area epiglottic fold. Um, and that constituted stage four cancer. And, uh, you know, one of the, um, one of the little notes I actually had on my refrigerator, um, that helped me to remember is, uh, it says, uh, we, we all have two lives to live. The second one begins when you realize you only have one. And so, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, is that I want to talk about my own personal journey and uh, what I've learned about about cancer and working with it uh, from really from a functional medicine view. So as um, as we go forward, let's see if I am it does okay. It appears that uh, there's a little delay on my advancing the slide. So I'm going to talk about the the Warburg effect and and the metabolic approach. Uh, to cancer. We're going to talk about fasting, uh, fasting mimicking diets. Uh, we're going to talk about ketogenic diets, uh, the role and relationship of the microbiome and immunotherapy, and uh, and talk about modifiable lifestyle factors. But as I begin, I want to um, read a, um, a poem by the author, the poet Mary Oliver, um, that helped, that's helped me. And uh, you know, one day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house 
began to tremble, and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, mend my life. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, and though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough in a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. It kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. On that following day, which was Thanksgiving Day, um, my wife and I uh, told our sons, about what was happening and we spoke with the doctors about it and we um and i had a couple weeks uh, before i was going to begin therapy and so i uh, in addition to the things mark mentioned i've also been um apprenticed and, and trained and initiated as a traditional healer by the by the huichol people the weirataka people in the sierra madres in mexico and so I went down and I, I worked with a teacher there and he said, uh, you know, you've been looking for transformation. I've often talked about transformation, cancer as a sign of transformation. And he said, you know, you have so much to give. Um, you need to do everything that you possibly can. And so it became very clear to me. And with that, you know, kind of uh, in your face, stage four cancer diagnosis, it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to do everything I possibly can. So I began the journey with uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy, uh, which after talking to consultants at the, at the clinic and, and other places around the world was really the best therapy that was available. Um, but I also wanted to look at other kinds of tools. So this isn't a stock image. This is actually me, um, you know, in position to receive the radiation therapy beams. Um, 70, 70 gray to my left neck and 56 gray to my right neck. And uh, I did that every day for uh, or five days a week for seven weeks and had chemotherapy weekly, um, had acupuncture and, and also worked a lot with nutrition, which I'm going to talk about here um, as I began to study and learn more about the, the metabolic basis of cancer. You know, so just to review sort of if you will, um, mitochondrial function and what that means, um, you know, generally energy production is going to be through not only glycolysis, breaking glucose down into pyruvate and then and where we get to ATP, but also then through the oxidative phosphorylation of the mitochondria, which is going to produce uh, 36 molecules of ATP. That's the most useful way, the most efficient way to produce energy. Now, what's what's interesting is that, you know, when you have less uh, oxygen available, you'll move into glycolysis and you'll produce lactic acid. And, you know, we, we know and we understand that. But what Otto Warburg found in 1924 was that, that cancer cells have a tendency to... Um, exhibit increased rates of glycolysis, even when there's oxygen available. So they're, they're using glucose as, and glycolysis at, at this, that two ATP as its principal source of being able to get energy. So let's just look at it again real quickly. So glucose enters the cell and it gets converted to broken down into two, three carbon particles into pyruvate that can then move into, um, that circulates back and forth to make lactate. Um, and that pyruvate is then used to make acetyl-CoA and move into the Krebs cycle. And that Krebs cycle, which is, um, then produces uh, FADH, um, plus a, FADH2 and NADH and, and produces ATP through the oxidative phosphorylation, which is a, an efficient process, but it's got a, it will produce reactive oxygen species along the way. Uh, what we find is that uh, this is going to produce a lot of energy. But within cancer cells, we see something that different that goes on. We see that the cancers are using that same first part of the process of glycolysis, but they want and need more and more glucose because that's the primary way. Even though there's oxygen, the mitochondria aren't working as well. And so we see that that there's more lactate production that occurs, and that's going to cause a more acidic pH, which stimulates uh, 
vascular endothelial growth factor, which stimulates um, angiogenesis, it decreases NK cell function, and may actually helps to immobilize the immune system to some extent. And so we see this is all happening, even though there's plenty of oxygen available, we see the mitochondria aren't working as well. We don't really know why this is happening in this way. There's some theories about it that, that basically say, well, it's one way of being able to, to gain energy and have accessibility um, to, to, without using the proteins and fats uh, for energy production, but rather to allow those to build cells. Uh, it certainly is involved in the the lactic acid production, uh, which fa which is uh, produces the acidic environment, which is favored, and and the other factors that I mentioned before around NK cell function and and VEGF. We also find that there's a decrease in the reactive oxygen species that are created because that happens through the oxidative phosphorylation process, and so those decreased reactive oxygen species are going to make the cells less susceptible to cancer cells, less susceptible to chemotherapy. You know, so what we see is that the cancer cells are more dependent. And when I'm talking about this, let me jump ahead a bit. And so those that are, are the most um, sensitive to insulin are going to be um, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, a glioblastoma multiforme, and early prostate cancer. Uh, also, radiation-sensitive uh, uh, cancers are going to be m more, much more sensitive, and we'll go into that in more detail. But those are primarily, um, while those are some of the most common cancers that we have, those are the, the, the cancer arenas that I'm talking about as we look at this. Now, we do see that patients who have metabolic syndrome, who have diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, do have poor prognosis uh, overall. And we've, we've, so then how do we shift that metabolism? How do we change that metabolism? And one of the ways is through fasting. And when I talk about different kinds of fasting, we talk about intermittent fasting last and talk about uh, energy restriction. And then some of the, the data on that um, from Dr. Walter Longo at uh, USC and the fasting mimicking diet. And then we'll also, I'll also talk um, later about the ketogenic diet and the approach with that. You know, so what we see is that there is a, a differential stress response, and that is that healthy cells are going to respond differently than cancer cells in the fasting environment. In, when we're fasting, the healthy cells are going to slow down their metabolic rate uh, in order to be able to maintain um, themselves. But if you have chemotherapy, chemotherapy is going to be focused on those things that are dividing more rapidly. And so there's a differential response to the stressors that are occurring in the situation. Um, the cancer cells can't, you know, kind of go into hibernation and slow down their growth and metabolism. And so uh, they're going to be more susceptible to the chemotherapy, and they're also going to be more susceptible to nutrient deprivation, especially glucose, because they're relying on glucose as, as a principal means of energy support. Again, now, this is not every single cancer in this way. And one of the things that I learned in evaluating this is that there's people who are promoting this idea who are thinking that it applies to every single cancer. It does not. It applies to those specific cancers that I spoke to as well as um, as cancers that are sensitive to radiotherapy because ra radiation therapy actually expands the therapeutic window. Um, for, um, I'm sorry, uh, fasting expands the therapeutic window and ketogenic diet expands the therapeutic window of radiation therapy. And so what we see in this, uh, in this graphic, in this image, is that we see the healthy cells and the cancer cells. Now, when chemotherapy is given, there's this differential stress response uh, where the... Um, where the the dead the the healthy cells are going to be affected, there are going to be um, you know uh, therapeutic adverse events that that happen, and there's going to be it's going to kill some normal cells, and it's going to decrease the size of the tumor. But when we do that along with fasting or fasting mimicking diet, and we'll look at some of the data on that. Um, we see that there is a a greater effect on the cancer cells than there would be without fasting, and there is less effect on the on the healthy cells. So, in, in theory, this makes sense. Now, in in looking at and investigating this, I have to say that I was lucky that I chose to, to move. I had been working with a fasting mimicking diet with patients with 
with metabolic syndrome and diabetes and was aware of it and shifting the metabolic aspects because two years previous to that, I had developed insulin resistance and had used those tools to be able to drop 30 pounds and you know decrease my blood pressure and be able to move into a, a much healthier position. And that's one of the things that, I, that when I'm working with cancer patients is like, I want them to be the healthiest cancer patients possible. And so we're working with nutrition and all the aspects of lifestyle to be able to optimize their health and well-being. You know, so here we see again, graphic in which the um with fasting we have a decrease in insulin like growth factor one a decrease in igf1 and stimulation a decrease in the amount of glucose uh, that is present so we don't see the warburg effect with aerobic -like glycolysis going on um, we see uh, decreases uh, that will allow autophagy to be able to occur normally so right autophagy that's the um you know the disassembly of dysfunctional or uh, unnecessary cellular components that is a necessary component that has to happen um, to be able to create program cell death you know when things aren't working well the cancer cells are effectively able to shut that down they also we when we have a decrease in oxidative phosphorylation we have a decrease in reactive oxygen species we're, we're stimulating the fasting helps uh, to be able to increase the reactive oxygen species, which is going to not only um, help the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but it's also going to, as well as the NK, uh, the natural killer cell, but it's also going to sensitize the cell to the chemotherapy. So this is the, the mechanistic aspect upon, uh, of what's going on. It's talked about in a little more detail here. So when we look at the role of, of calorie restriction in affecting anti-cancer therapy, calorie restriction in the middle CR or fasting or fasting mimicking diet, and we see that it will have an effect on decreasing the activity overall in the, uh, of normal cells. And it's going to, um, with chemotherapy, it's going to decrease um, the, the treatment emergent adverse effects. Uh, and it's going to lead to a, overall an increased sensitivity that's going on of the tumor cells and the tumor microenvironment. Uh, when we look at angiogenesis, it's going to be decreased. There's going to be decrease in inflammation, decrease in IGF-1, decrease in glucose, decrease in insulin, decrease in, in inflammatory cytokines. So all of those things are going on that are going to be supportive of the process of working to optimize chemotherapy. So let's look at some of the studies that have been done. Um, first one's done by uh, Tanya Dorf working with Walter Longo in 2009. And what they demonstrated was that there was a decrease in adverse events uh, across a number of different adverse events. I'll show that data in a moment. Um, that led to further studies that were done in you know, 2015 through 2020. And there's a number of studies that are being done actively at this point in time as well, working to understand how do we optimize it. Now, one of the, the first studies that was done by DeGroote, uh, they did a 48-hour water fast, starvation, for um, 24 hours before and 24 hours after chemotherapy. And they were able to show um, that there was uh, an, an improved recovery of the DNA damage that occurred, and there was decreased uh, toxicity to the white blood cells. Uh, another study was done with 200 calories per day, uh, and they looked at at uh, just the day of chemotherapy or a day before, two days before, and three days before. And what they found was that that was in patients with breast and ovarian cancer. And they were able to show decreased uh, DNA addicts, de decreased DNA damage, and decreased neutropenia uh, that was going on. And then the, the last study that was done more recently, uh, uh, for, they used a 400-calorie diet, uh, 1,200 calories the first day and then 400 calories per day um, and for 36 hours before and 24 hours after chemotherapy. And they were able to improve the quality of life and be able to show that there were um, no adverse events related to the, the, the chemotherapy. Now, it's interesting. We find that, uh, that typically um, we use steroids uh, with all chemotherapy injections um, that are given to help decrease the side effects that are there. And uh, a more recent study that I uh, don't know if I have on, on this uh, um, listing here, um, it, it demonstrates that, that, they're, that when patients are not fasting or when they are fasting that, and they don't get 
the steroids, right? Because a counter-regulatory hormone is going to push up the glucose and we don't want that, um, that they they still don't have an increase in adverse events, even though they're not taking the steroid, which has been, which is shown to be helpful to decrease the, 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 the immediate adverse events, the immediate side effects that go on from the chemotherapy, but they've been able to tolerate it and do well. So this was the original study by Tanya Dorff and Walter Longo back in 2009, which showed, you know, the memory loss, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all those aspects they were decreased uh, when fasting was occurring. So we find that it decreases the DNA damage in the white blood cells. It decreases IGF-1. Um, and we see um, benefits that happen immediately. And this was the study that I wanted to mention that came out this summer, um, looking at uh, 131 patients that were randomized. These were uh, breast cancer patients. And what they were able to demonstrate in this cohort was an improvement overall in the, um, to just uh, let me remember the exact uh, specifics of the, of the study. Um, they were able to show radiographically um, that there was a, a greater response in the patients who did the FMD uh, with an odd, odds ratio, radiographic improvement, odds ratio of 3.2. Uh, they showed that uh, tumor loss, 90 to 100% tumor loss that they were evaluating. Uh, those patients who used the FMD, the fasting mimicking diet, had a fourfold increase improvement uh, over those who did not. And there was no difference in toxicity between the groups, even though there was no steroids that were given at the time of therapy. So provocative. And so what that meant for me was I said, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast. Now it's weekly. Um, most of these studies are done with a Q3 week uh, process. So I didn't know where to go. So I said, well, I'm going to fast weekly and decrease uh, my calories, just taking broth, uh, 200 to 400 calories a day uh, for the day before and the day of chemotherapy. And you know, there was a lot of caution about that because one of the big issues that happens with a head and neck cancer is that you lose your taste and then you also, it, the scarring can occur. And so I had to have a peg tube placed and I'm like, are you going to be able to get enough calories in each week if you're limiting two of your days of calories uh, to just 200 to 400 calories? Um, that was a concern uh, and it was felt like you shouldn't do that. But I felt pretty strongly about the data and wanted to do everything that I could and said, well, if it doesn't work, then I'll you know, I'll go back to not fasting at that point in time, but that was part of the process of what I did. I also worked with a, a ketogenic diet. We look at a ketogenic diet um, that is 80 to 85 percent fat, and there's and part of the key of the of the ketogenic diet is that you have to be really aware of the protein content that's going in, because if you have excess protein in some of these, you know, uh, carnivorous diets or things like that, that's going to drive. Um, the the Krebs cycle, and you you don't really want that that happening. You want fat to be burned. You want to be in ketosis. You know, so this has been used for a hundred years. You know, first to help avoid malnourishment, used with uh, refractory um, seizure activity that was going on, even helping to deal with cachexia. And so, you know, when we look at what's normally happening with carbohydrate restriction, you know, if the glucose levels are limited, then the body will go into beta oxidation in the liver and it will break down fats and those, and those fats will, will then be used or those ketone bodies, the beta hydroxybutyrate will be used, uh, moving into the Krebs cycle in order to be able to help the mitochondria to produce energy. Uh, it's a great energy form, but you know the cancer cells can't use that because their mitochondria aren't working as well. Um, so here we see just the, the the normal process of breakdown of beta oxidation, and and within a functional medicine approach, you know where we're th we're considering what's happening with the inputs of proteins, fats, and carbs, and how does that have an effect on overall metabolism? What we see is that the the generation of ketosis is something that is it can be useful. And so therapies that are going to lower the overall amount of glucose uh, and increase the ketones put more energy stress on the cancer. This is the, the, the premise by Dr. Tom Seafried and the metabolic basis of cancer and others talk about it. And it does apply. It does apply to those cancers that are particularly insulin sensitive. 
you know, so the, the ketogenic diet is going to reduce lactate levels, uh, which, which is going to have an effect on not providing that acidic environment. Um, and it's going to decrease the amount of glucose that's available for a aerobic glycolysis by the, by the tumor cells. Uh, we see that beta hydroxybutyrate has many different mechanisms in the way in which it works, helping to support innate immunity, decreasing the th seizure threshold, but most importantly, decreasing insulin and modulating PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma. But decreasing insulin is the, is the biggest issue because insulin is a driver of tumor progression as we see at the bottom there, particularly in breast colorectal endometrial pancreatic and glioblastoma multiforme. Also in radiation therapy sensitive cancers. So we would add to that list uh, uh, head and neck cancers as well as anal rectal cancers. Now, when we, we get into looking at this, we kind of can begin to differentiate and we can say that uh, the radiation sensitive data shows that the radiation sensitive cancers and the glioblastoma multiforme are the ones that have the best evidence on a ketogenic diet. Others looking at low, lower carb diets uh, include um, uh, breast cancer, um, especially those who are postmenopausal with e who with ER positive cancers and colorectal cancers, decreasing the carbohydrate load, maybe not needing to go all the way to to ketosis, uh, but considering that. Now, one of the things that happens in that uh, time when you're beginning to gather data is. Um, you know, shared with a friend of mine and talked with a friend of mine, John Weeks, who'd had a head and neck cancer 10 years earlier, who had a very difficult time with his treatment, but indicated um, that he thought that getting a feeding tube was going to be really important early on. Uh, and so I made the decision to do that uh, kind of prophylactically. He said, you don't want to wait until you can't eat anything and you're losing massive weight. And that's the big issue is losing 20, 30 pounds uh, during this kind of treatment. And so I, I had that placed, but then we were talking about a ketogenic diet and there's just, there's just nothing there in terms of, of ketogenic diets, that high fat diets that can go into a feeding tube. So here we am, that's me with my, my feeding tube uh, in place as we prepared to do this. And, you know, I had the good fortune that my, my wife, uh, who's a physician embraced this fully. And so she would mix up concoctions uh, that would include lots of sardines and coconut oil and other kinds of whole foods uh, that would be pureed in the Vitamix and, and, uh, and warm up enough so that they were liquid and and given and so that was part of uh, because of my increased metabolic rate i was needing about 2700 2800 calories a day on the days i was eating in order to be able to um to maintain my weight um and so i i was able to one of the fortunate things is i was able to eat through the whole process i never got to a point where i wasn't able to eat um, because uh, I really had not the same kinds of side effects that they normally see with all of their uh, patients who are having radiation therapy. I'd go in and see the oncologist and the radiation therapy doc, and they're like, really, you're still eating? Really, you're not having problems? Um, so I was very fortunate. And I think some of that was also related to the fact that, you know, I work to um, get my ketone levels up. Um, Michelle, it's not advanced. There we go. Um, and so on... Um, you know, I would get into uh, nutritional ketosis. Uh, generally, the ketones were running 1.5 to 2, but on the days of chemotherapy, uh, when I was really uh, more in the fasting, the fasting approach, the fasting mimicking approach, um, my, I would get my ketones up to about 4.5. So uh, I found that uh, to be really important and useful. So here we see some of the data on the, the dietary approaches to oncology and and um, things that have been helpful in, in addition to, to, uh, um, you know, to the approach of a fasting mimicking diet with chemotherapy and the use of a ketogenic diet and when they're, they're useful. And you can see the, the references there from this uh, great article on Nature Reviews Cancer from Nincioni and Walter Longo back in 2018. You know, the, in addition to those things, there's also the value of intermittent fasting. And with intermittent fasting, you know, what we see is, again, similarly, there is going to be, you know, with a, a prolonged 
um, daily fasting of 14 to 16 hours, there's going to be a decrease in IGF-1. That decrease in IGF-1 is going to um, decrease circulating uh, and, and the fasting is going to decrease circulating glucose. So you're not going to see the Warburg effect. You're going to see a decrease in glycolysis that happens, an increase in the fatty acid movement through the, 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 um, the citric acid cycle and production of of ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, which is also going to increase the reactive oxygen species, which is going to make the, the cells more susceptible to chemotherapy that's going on. So here we see this process of multiple different components and ways to be able to approach Im improvement overall. Now, one of the things that was a concern to me early on uh, was, well, what's happening with my microbiome with this? And one of the big concerns when we see um, people who are on a ketogenic diet is they'll actually, uh, unless you're using a strong focus of plant-based foods uh, to, excuse me, to be able to do this, you're, you're going to decrease the diversity of the gut microbiome. And so how do I maintain the diversity of my gut microbiome? Because we know that there's a relationship between uh, what's going on in the gut and what's going on with the production of cancer. And so we find this, you know, the term dysbiosis that we talk about, and it's really um, helpful to me to see, you know, the International Cancer Microbiome Consortium talking about the importance and role of the, of the microbiome in relationship to what's going on. And so we can see that a, an imbalanced microbiome can lead to an increase in cancer. And we can see that a balanced microbiome can have a, a beneficial effect overall. It's going to prevent, you know, tumor genesis. So we see data there, but what I, I got really interested in uh, was looking at the idea that I may need immunotherapy. And if I need immunotherapy, how do I optimize my gut microbiome? Now, I want to uh, credit uh, uh, Dr. Calabrese in, in the audience there for helping me to become aware of the role of the microbiome with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors and what they, were, what they were doing. And what we find is that with the new kinds of antibodies with immunotherapy, whether they're P1 program cell death proteins or uh, CTL4, the cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigens, that the, in each of those areas, there's a microbiome signature that is related to an improvement in response to immunotherapy, as well as a, a change in the toxicity from the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Now, both of those things need to be considered. And it is interesting to note that we see that patients who have been on significant antibiotics or a proton pump inhibitor actually have an increase in the toxicity and a decreased disease-free survival after treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors, which tells us that those aspects of altering the gut microbiome actually make a huge difference. Uh, it was I did not, have not yet had to go to working immunotherapy, but the aspect of my work with dysbiosis in the gut was really, you know, stimulated me to be able to learn more and understand more about the role of specific different agents. And here we see this kind of, you know, a beautiful picture that, uh, that Dr. Hunt, um, you know, shared with me and I to take a look at, uh, at that article in, in Nature Medicine, you know, looking at how we prepare the gut microbiome for immunotherapy. But what I've done is I've kind of broken down some of the data right here, where we can see that the the, the anti-inflammatory micro, microbiota, like Acromantia mucinophilia, actually improves the therapeutic response. That Bacteroides and Fecalobacterium presnutsi actually improves the therapeutic response in in response in relationship to the anti-CLA uh, for uh, immunotherapies. Uh, we can see as as we go down then things like uh, bacteroides uh, bacteroides is interesting because there is a decreased therapeutic response with bacteroides but there's also a decreased toxicity 
Whereas with uh, the other Fecalobacterium species, not not Fecalobacterium presnitsi, but with the other Fecalobacterium, you know, with CT, anti-CTLA-4 therapy, we see that there's an improved therapeutic response, but there's also more toxicity. So it's like, how do we find the right balance of the system to be able to go forward here? And one of the uh, slides I'd hoped uh, to be able to show was a new article that was out just uh, uh, two days ago from uh, from gut pathogens uh, by Miller and Carson. And this particular slide was one that, uh, you know, is called the mechanisms and microbial influence of CTLA-4 and PD-1-based immunotherapy in the treatment of cancer, a narrative review. It's a great review. Um, I can uh, give that to Michelle and, and have that be available to you as well, but I wasn't able to show that, that slide here today. So, those are some of the aspects of looking at nutrition, but within um, functional medicine, we don't just go there. We, we look at the, all these personalized modifiable lifestyle factors. So we're going to take into account, well, what's going on with stress? We know in our patients that the role and relationship between stress and, and nutrition are, are some of the key elements that are leading to imbalance and that it's our role to help them to be able to move towards a, uh, a more balanced place looking at exercise and movement, sleep and relaxation, as well as, as relationships and meaning and connection in life. So I want to talk about another kind of finding that I had. And, and a number of you have heard me talk about, you know, in clinical practice around heart rate variability and looking at the role of, of HRV. Uh, HRV is a tool that can help us to begin to discriminate the difference between a parasympathetic state and a, and a sympathetic overdrive state. When we're sympathetically overdriven, go, 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 that what happens is that the variance between our heart rates tightens. It gets much smaller. I think about it as, as having more rigidity versus in the, in the place of relaxation, there is more spaciousness between each of the heart rates. So that heart rate variability is a great tool for helping us to understand and can be used as a biofeedback tool to be able to say, well, what's really going on here uh, in terms of the stress response? Because obviously if we have a strong fight or flight response and we have a higher um reactivity and a low heart rate variability, there's going to be sympathetic overdrive. And we know that that sympathetic overdrive is going to act as a counter-regulatory hormone and increase overall glucose levels. It's going to increase cortisol levels, which are going to increase glucose levels. So we don't want that. We see that the lower heart rate uh, variability is associated with, with tumor growth through these various kinds of, of mechanisms and pathways. So here's the thing. This is uh, from my Aura Ring, um, you know, and I was getting chemotherapy and I was pretty wiped out and I couldn't do my normal exercise routine. And I knew I needed to get outside, um, but I didn't have energy to go for a long hike or a walk. And so I would just go outside and I would play in the little stream uh, and springs on, on the land that I live on. And all of a sudden, I started looking at what was happening to my heart rate variability. Here we see kind of, you know, month over month data. And, you know, we see that uh, the, the base there at, at 15, a very low, that's a very low heart rate variability. You know, but what we found, what I found was that it m more than doubled as I began to just spend time in nature. And this was kind of startling to me because I wasn't, you know, I was already eating a good diet. I was getting eight hours of sleep a night. I was getting deep sleep. I was you know, doing other things to, to focus on taking care of myself and meditation and prayer. Um, and yet the role of nature just all of a sudden it kind of jumped out at me. And so then I began to look at, you know, some of the data on forest bathing, what the Japanese call Shrinin Yoku you know, and its role in being able to increase NK cell function. And what they find is that by spending two nights and three days in the forest, that you actually can maintain an increased NK cell activity for a whole month period of time. Now that happens through an increase in uh, various anti-inflammatory uh, processes, but we also find that there's an increase in these anti-cancer proteins um, that are present there. So these are some of the elements, um, but I also want to talk about the role of connection, connection to nature, 
connection to self and connection to others in terms of the overall process. You know, we look at these personalized, modifiable lifestyle factors, but we also want to look at the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspect of what's going on. I was fortunate in that I was able to create an optimal he healing environment because my, my two sons, um, they were living in the same town. And so when I had chemotherapy every week, we would be together. Um, they would come and they would uh, cook meals one night a week and, and help out. At a time when uh, my wife Lisa was gone, I had some friends who came and stayed with me and took care of me. Some of you may recognize Lori Hoffman on the right there, the former CEO of the Institute for Functional Medicine. And I received so much help and support from people. So here I am ringing the bell at the end of radiation therapy, and I'm wearing this cape, this cape that you saw me, that um, one of my community members made for me, and she put little pockets in it. In the pockets, she then invited people to send me cards and trinkets and things. And I had over a hundred things in the pockets of that cape uh, that helped me to just feel like I am really cared for by so many people. You know, so as a connecting to meaning and purpose in what's going on. Atal Gawande, you know, says, you know, that really, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, well-being has to do with why we want to be alive, not just at the end of life or when some disability comes along, but all the way along. So when we look at the, the data, like on psychological well-being, you know, of, of having no purpose, things seem trivial versus having a, a sense of purpose in my life, a score of six um, versus zero. When we look at this Myers-Kaplan curve of data generated in, in JAMA just last year, you can see that the people who don't have a reason to live like their survival probability at seven years period it's at six years period of time as it was marched out was 25 percent of them had died whereas those people who had meaning and purpose is a cohort of population of people who are over 50 years old you know for that that cohort of people who had meaning and purpose only 12 percent of them had died during that same period of time it makes a difference having meaning and purpose in your life makes a difference. So let me see. Okay. I'm having a little trouble with my mouse here. So, you know, I just want to highlight that, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, when I was given this diagnosis, you know, we want to cure if we possibly can, but really we want to, you know, stop the suffering from happening and we want to help the well being of our patients. And going towards looking at the well-being, you know, Francis Peabody 100 years ago said the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. But one of the things that I found out through this process was that the thing that was necessary for me to learn and to do is that I had to begin with taking care of myself in the process. Not an easy thing. You know, for those of us who've gone through training and really focusing outside of ourselves, but caring for ourselves allows us to care for other people. So as I started, one day I finally knew what I had to do and began. Determined to do the only thing I could do. Determined to save the only life I could save. This was uh, last year in uh, September in the Sierra Madres, uh, where I work with the Wiratica people, uh, with my wife, Lisa, uh, looking, overlooking the, the beauty that's there. And the, the, the thing that I want to just kind of close with is just the reminder, you know, that uh, we all have to follow our own journey and to be truly happy, you know, you have to, we have to fall in love, fall in love with all of creation, with everything that is there. And I feel really blessed to, you know, in the end, um, this journey has helped me to grow, to feel um, like a, a more complete human being and, and actually, curious, curiously, a better doctor. So uh, you know, that's, uh, that's my journey and I'm still on it. It continues. Uh, it's not done yet. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for that deep and beautiful and scientifically insightful conversation about cancer in general, your cancer and your journey to healing. And I think it's very moving and uh, 
stimulating and challenging and uh, makes us think about things that I don't think we normally think about, which is one, how do we actually maximize conventional treatment using diet? It's not high on the radar. How do we maximize our microbiome and our diet? And then how do we, you know, find the meaning and purpose in life, which is very beautiful. So thank you so much. Um, I, I want to open it up to questions. We have a few minutes for Q and A, about fifteen minutes, and would love to uh, sort of facilitate a little Q and A with Patrick. I might, while we're waiting for questions, I might start off uh, with one of my own. Oh, there's Dr. Husney. <laughs> you have a question, Dr. Husney? I do. Just a just a uh, whoops, just a simple question for Dr. Hannaway. That was. Beautiful, wonderful, thank you. I was just curious how you felt your physicians spoke with each other, like the ones in nutrition, the ones, the cancer doctor, or were you the one uh, really communicating? I was just wondering how that went and any um, advice, mm. uh, you know, when people come in with uh, with all these different doctors that are, you know, with the same goal of caring for you. Yeah. Well, I'd say it's, uh, hello, Elaine, great to see you. Um, it's a both and, um, you know, the, the oncologist, um, that I worked with and, you know, I had the opportunity to, you know, I had offers from friends there in the audience to come to Cleveland and get treated there and, and to be able to do that. But I wanted to be at home. I wanted to be around my family. And, and what I found was, is that the doctors who were here were giving me the same information as the, as the doctors, you know, from Cleveland Clinic and Hopkins and MD Anderson. So, you know, I felt, I felt really supported here. And the oncologist is someone who I'd been referring patients to my cancer patients for the past 20 years uh, here locally. So I, I trusted him inherently and he didn't have a big knowledge base around nutrition, nor did the radiation oncologist, but they were interested. They were open. Uh, they were like, you know, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause harm. You know, the idea of, of pulling the, the dexamethasone, the steroids out of the, the chemotherapy bag, that was a hard one for them to be able to, to work with. But, you know, it was more like the staff didn't know how to do with it. And I said, you know, Mike, I really, this is important to me. And he said, okay, we'll do it. And so I found the, the clinicians to work really well together with each other and be really open to what our perspectives were. And, and, and curiously, they became more open to it as time went on because I didn't lose any weight. I didn't, you know, stop eating. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have to take any pain medicines or any anti-nausea medicines. You know, I, I was the outlier, uh, you know, in their treatment protocol of, of what they do. So at the end, they say, well, we leave, the, we leave the peg tube in, you know, for your feeding until two weeks after um, you're not losing any weight. You've maintained your weight for two weeks. Um, so I get done with the therapy and two weeks later, I said, well, here I am. I haven't lost any weight. It's time to take it out. And they said, oh, no, we've never taken it out this early. You know, you know you're going to continue to have problems. And, and, you know, the next week I, I came back in and, and, and one of the radiation uh, oncologists was just like, well, never done this before, but, you know, you're doing great. And he, he pulled the tube and, you know, I continue to do well. So they've been interested in having me talk about nutrition you know, to the other uh, head and neck cancer patients and what things could be done. Um, so I found, you know, a, a real openness uh, and a, a great collaboration. And, you know, and there are things where, you know, we could, I, I didn't get into it, but, you know, like the whole controversy in, in cancer treatment around antioxidants and things of that nature. And we could debate that. And I don't think anyone really knows, but it's like they didn't feel comfortable having me take antioxidants. Um, and I understand why in terms of you're wanting to induce reactive oxygen species in order to be able to have the effectiveness of the therapy. So I didn't take any of those. I mean, it's a collaboration. It wasn't like, I'm, you know, this is what I'm doing. You need to deal with it. I wanted to listen to their input as well. So. Hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I have a quick question while we're waiting. Thank you, Elaine. That was a great question. Uh, you know, just to, t to loop back on the antioxidant conversation, you know, I recall many conversations with patients and even oncologists who tell their patients to make sure they don't lose weight by eating a lot and by eating milkshakes and ice cream and tons of sugar 
Um, they do tell breast cancer patients not to consume soy, although they don't tell them not to drink, which is strange to me. But anyway, um, and and the the um, the antioxidant question sort of fits into that, which is if if the doctors are suggesting that we not eat antioxidants, then should we not be eating a whole foods diet rich in plant compounds that are far more potent antioxidants than what we can get from supplements if you eat a phytonutrient rich diet. So it seems to be a bit of contradiction. Should we just all be eating white bread and ice cream while we're getting chemo instead of eating a whole foods plant rich diet? I don't know. <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question, Mark? Uh, maybe. I just I just don't know like how we reconcile that and how they reconcile that and, 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 and the thinking behind it because it doesn't it doesn't seem coherent to me to 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 do that kind of advice when we do know that these cancers are really fueled by sugar, that they're fueled by uh, high levels of insulin resistance, and that the recommendations sort of don't drive with that. I think the radical first step is, and, you know, NCI supports this, is that looking at a, uh, a diverse whole foods diet, um, like that, that makes a difference. And, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, drinking the juice boxes and eating the ice cream, you know, when you're getting chemotherapy. It means, mm -hmm. you know, it's like it, that's a more radical change than talking about antioxidants, you know, and, mm. and getting people to do that and working with that and helping to understand that, you know, in uh, our new uh, um, our new cancer um, one one of the docs moved out of the hospital and is is the one I work with closely, you know, and it's like how do we help them to remove that stuff from you know, from what's happening in the chemotherapy suites and how do we help patients to be able to understand really what a whole foods diet is and how they can work with it. And, you know, as indicated, the, you know, the, the, the plant-based components of that are going to be the things that fuel the diversity, that fuel uh, the benefits in terms of decreased tumor genesis, as well as, you know, being able to prep, especially for those patients who are getting immunotherapy. You know, I've seen people mm -hmm. talk about, oh, well, we should use some certain, you know, uh, oncobiotics in order to do that. And I'm like, well, actually, the foods that you eat are the oncobiotics that are are going to make a difference and how do we promote that and so here we saw you know some some approaches that i took i mean frankly trying to eat a uh, a ketogenic diet with 80 percent fats through tube feeds and get adequate amounts of of plant-based um, phytonutrients that's not easy to do um, mm -hmm. you know, and so it was a struggle to be able to, to work with that, but it was something that, um, you know, I checked my, my metagenome beforehand and checked it afterwards. And it was better after the, after the work that I did with the kinds of, of tube feeds and the feeding I had, uh, during the, the several months of therapy, you know, and so I've maintained that kind of, uh, approach with uh with a, a low carb diet not not focusing on ketogenic although i do that every once in a while um and using a fasting mimicking diet on a quarterly basis just to help reset the met metabolic uh compass you know also work with some um you know um circulating uh tumor cell um scavenging kinds of kinds of therapies with vitamin c this is what i'm doing now post treatment. Um, so I, I do that and using artemisinin and other agents to be able to help as a cancer scavenging therapy to be able mm. to maintain, um, you know, I'll have my two year PET scan in December. Um, but mm. all, all of my, all of my markers in terms of, of IGF one and TGF beta and, and other inflammatory markers are all doing exceptionally well at this point in time. Hmm. So do you, do you think that um, the science is at a point now around diet intervention, both in terms of cancer prevention and cancer, uh, an adjunct of treatment to cancer therapy, is it a place where this should be standard of care? Well, I, I would say in terms of the prevention, um, absolutely. But most of our NCA guidelines talk about that and, and you know, it's really, as we find, it's getting people to, to do those kinds of approaches. That's the difficult mm. thing. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, on the prevention side, I think there's no doubt about it. You know, when we look on the, on the therapeutic side, right, I've talked about uh, several different things here. So I've talked about uh, the use of uh, a fasting mimicking diet or fasting in relationship to chemotherapy. 
you know, and that is, you know, the data has primarily been done looking at breast cancer patients. You know, if we uh, look at Dr. Longo's work and the development that they're doing, uh, there's, I think I was told 35 clinical trials that are underway at this point in time, looking at different forms of, of cancer in relationship to that. You know, so I don't think it's the standard of care yet, not at all. It's an investigation and, you know, you'll have patients who are interested in doing it. Um, you know, I've got a 37 year old woman with her first pregnancy who's got a, you know, stage two breast cancer, you know, who's decided that, you know, she wants to do the, the ketogenic approach and, and is also working with uh, fasting before chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, she's doing really well. Um, she actually just finished her fourth round and she's doing great at this point in time. It's, um, in, in terms of side effects. So I'm willing to recommend it to people who are interested in, in trying to optimize things. Um, but I'm like, you going to be more at the cutting edge of, of trying to find new ideas to try to minimize, but it's not yet the standard of care. And with the, the ketogenic diet approach and what people are talking about in terms of the metabolic basis of cancer, you know, I want to again, indicate that there are specific cancers that are specific, that are, that are clearly sensitive. That is, you know, when uh, radiotherapy is adjunctive therapy, a ketogenic diet has been shown to be very helpful, right? So those are gonna be head and neck cancers and anal rectal cancers. That's just kind of lucky that like that, you know, I was doing it because I thought it was broadly applicable. It happened to be specifically applicable to the cancer and the treatment that I had. Um, so mm. it's not, it's not the answer for everybody, you know, but, you know, using a whole foods plant-based diet, that is going to be, I think that's going to be helpful for everybody because that's what human beings are supposed to do. And, you know, the, the you mean, you mean plant-based or plant-rich? Plant-rich. Sorry. Yeah, you don't you don't mean a vegan diet, do you? No, no. I'm in, I'm talking about you know, but you know the amount of of plants in the diet you know needs to needs to comprise you know at least half of your plate all the time. Mm. Mm. You know, we've we've talked about this, and you know the the with the wondering about grains and and what's the role in whole grains. I think that's an open question, and and uh, you know <laughs> it's like I don't really focus on that. But if we're working to try to decrease the carbohydrate content, you know, you're going to be going lower on your grains a, as part of that. So, um, you know, again, mm. the, the low carb diets, uh, you know, specifically with, uh, with, with breast cancer and colorectal cancer have been shown to be effective also. Is there, is there a downside risk to doing it if people want to try? I mean, it, it, in other words, is there, is there concern about adverse effects of trying these dietary changes like ketogenic diets during cancer, or is it something that people would try and, and wouldn't be uh, causing risk? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. And I, I don't think that we, we know the complete answer to that at this point in time. The issue that I've had uh, with patients who have gone on, on ketogenic diets is it's not unlike, uh, you know, what I'll call the junk food vegetarians. I mean, if you're just eating, you know, um, corn oil and, you know, things of that nature in order to get your oil, your fat content up, but they're not good fats. I think, yeah, I think there's a big risk doing that. So you've got to be having, you know, foods that are, um, you know, that are nutritious. I mean, I don't know how to leave it that way. I mean, yeah, you talk about yeah. good fats and bad fats all the time. <laughs> so it's like, that's where I'm going. Yeah. It's not about fat. It's about the quality you know, is the exactly, quality of the nutrition. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been great. Dr. Calabrese, do you have I'm a question? Peeling off. I just want to thank Patrick for a uh, highly informative and highly motivating talk. And I need to catch up with you. Call you. I love that, Lenny. Thank you so much. And thanks. I, you know, the shout out was real. You know, you helped me to, to see the relationship of the microbiome and, uh, and, and checkpoint inhibitors. So thank you for uh, continuing to mentor and teach us. You've given me a lot of joy today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. I don't know if we have time for another question. I, I guess uh, we do have we do have one from Dr. Bradley, which is um, with a keto diet, chemo, and the risk of tumor lysis and uric acid, would those cause more kidney issues? Um, in particular, with gout um, or uric acid stones or something of that nature. I'm a little leery of that with the ketosis. 
You don't know the answer to that question, Liz. I think it's a good question, and it's one that I've not looked at um, specifically. Um, you know, I think in terms of, of uric acid production, it really is dependent upon, you know, are the, um, you know, are the foods that you're eating, you know, you're, you know, eating organ meats and things like that, you know, certainly can increase the, uh, the uric acid content, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. And, you know, note that, you know, we're not talking about any kind of, uh, of renal cancers here either. Right. Mm. Thank you, Patrick, for a great yeah. talk. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Patrick, for joining us and our Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. It's fantastic to have you back. And uh, thank you for sharing your incredible experience with us. I think it's it's a great case study of uh, what we should all be thinking about as we think about our cancer patients and diet in general and some of the impact of, of your own personal experience. So thank you so much for sharing and being part of it. I think everybody will be able to watch this uh, on our Functional Medicine Cleveland Clinic uh, website at the Center for Functional Medicine and the Grand Round section, and uh, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you.